Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite everybody to please take a seat. We will begin our first discussion immediately. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I've mentioned earlier on, today's topic would be Are Political Parties Essential in a Parliamentary Democracy? Your moderator for today's topic itself is today Mr. Kamarul Bahrain Harun. Encik Kamarul, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, I guess some, for some, the news is more outside the hall than inside. But I promise you, for 25 years that I've been in news, current affairs, and the media, I know how to change that equation because it's better. The lesser you have in here, the more we on stage can speak. So that start, and they will have to make up the time that they have lost. Um, the topic, I, when I got it, I said, you guys don't need me to moderate this topic. Because any political science student can actually discuss this topic. But then again, it's not meant to be literal. We all know the answer to the topic. Are political parties essential in parliamentary democracy? We all know the answer. The problem is how to market and benchmark it to reality. If you Google why political parties are essential in the democracy, one of it is to make sure that there are smooth distribution of limited resources in a nation within a society. Political parties are also supposed to ensure a smooth check and balance between those in power and those who are not. Political parties are also supposed to ensure that every single citizen are well represented. But the question is, now with the pandemic and the economic issues because of the pandemic, are they ticking the boxes of all these questions and more? Even the organizer, when they asked for my profile, I said, please introduce me as somebody who is jobless at the moment. Yeah, but that's how we are, right? When we come into a nice hall room, somebody must be associated to something. I am not. The fact is, I lost one family member and I lost my job during the pandemic. How are the political parties looking out for my interests? So these are the questions. So please do not be too obsessed with how simple this topic of this session is, but look deeper look wider, and you have three of the best in politics of the country from my assessment to talk about this with you. I myself would like to make a personal and professional apology for the failure to insist that there must be someone who doesn't look like the four of us on stage. But unfortunately, life has other plans that sometimes we cannot control. So why be Michelle can't join us this morning and because of that there's no gender balance in this session however for those online and those who are here especially the ladies i promise you when it comes to the questions i will allow more questions from the other side of the imbalance here i promise you that if the government and political parties cannot give you balance, I, the moderator, will give you balance today, okay? Is that okay? Can I hear a response? Is this Malaysia or not? Can I hear a bit more? Okay. Thank you so much. Um, they need no introduction, but I will introduce them a bit anyway. We have YBs on stage. Lucky Shahril doesn't have a YB in front of his name. I would be a minority otherwise. But we have YB Khalid. And also we have YB Senator Yusmadi. We have Saudara Shahril over there. So they represent all different political parties. Amana, PKR and AMNO. Two of them are also chief of communication for their party. YB Khalid and also Saudara Shahril. But... I told them there's two rounds to the format today on stage. 
One is they going to go to the mic and stand, and they're going to give you about six minutes of their own take on the topic today. After that is done, then they will sit back down, and we will just have a chat. A chat that I hope you will come in and give in your views for what is democracy if we only listen to the few. Democracy means every single person is important. So without further ado, YB Khaled, can you please do the honors? Because the first round, we go by gerontology. Then only we have democracy of the youngest starting. Please, YB Khaled, over to you. Okay, please. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Very good morning to everyone. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to say that I just had my first shot of uh, the COVID uh, vaccine this morning at 9. And uh, so if I mark up the session, uh, blame it on the antibodies. Uh, if I say anything stupid or, uh, you know, uh, illogical. Uh, so I, actually, I, I mentioned uh, this to the uh, uh, organizers and they had a standby speaker for me. Uh, but it seems that he's left the hall when he saw I came. <laughs> so uh, that's first. The second is about the uh, topic. Uh, I found the topic uh, rather uh, interesting. Uh, our moderator, Cik Kamarul, has mentioned that uh, everybody knows the answer to it. So uh, it's a, a bit strange. Uh, uh, to have a topic which uh, we think that everybody knows the answer to. Yeah? Uh, but uh, I see that in the uh, summary uh, explaining the topic, uh, it relates to the question of uh, party hopping and uh, whether this uh, incessant problem of uh, party hopping, which is a, a new pandemic in Malaysia as well, uh, not just the COVID, uh, but this uh, uh, yeah, situation where people are changing sides and uh, forgetting what they promised, uh, it's got personally got nothing to do with the question of uh, the parties, uh, but more so a question of the integrity of the individuals uh, concerned. Yeah? Uh, I think uh, everyone is aware that right from uh, day one, uh, when uh, PH uh, took over the government, uh, there were factions within it or individuals within it uh, who felt that uh, they do not want to stay in uh, Pakatan Harapan and uh, they had their own personal agenda and uh, well, in general everyone puts the blame on uh, Azmin Ali having relations with uh, AMNO, having relations with PAS uh, right from day one and uh, obviously uh, when Pakatan Harapan was uh, formed uh, he himself uh, was against the idea and uh, during the launch of Pakatan Harapan, uh, where we named uh, Tun Mahathir as the uh, candidate for the prime ministership, uh, he walked out uh, of uh, the convention. Yeah? He walked out in protest because he did not agree to Pakatan Harapan. He wanted Pakatan Rakyat, uh, where the relationship between PKR and PAS uh, would be further sustained and maintained and uh, used for the uh, 14th general elections. So uh, from there, what we can see is that uh, obviously the issue of the parties and the existence of uh, political parties is in itself not a problem. Uh, the problem uh, is with uh, the uh, individuals who uh, are willing or able uh, to say one thing in, uh, in front of you and do something else uh, behind you. Yeah? So I think uh, what has happened is that the Malaysian public has uh, been given the opportunity to uh, witness for themselves and realize uh, the importance of uh, finding individuals uh, with uh, integrity. In terms of uh, the general mandate, uh, what we can see is that uh, nobody has uh, questioned or refuted that uh, the general uh, public, as far as the Malaysian uh, voters are concerned, they wanted a Pakatan Harapan government. And what should have been done uh, by uh, political parties who are responsible and uh, respect the mandate of the public and the voters is not to support uh, the people, the turncoats, and, uh, and uh, to enable them 
to form a government. Yeah? So while the general public, to a large extent, has put much of the blame on Azmin and uh, uh, Mohyuddin uh, as being uh, the people who jumped ship, I cannot uh, but put uh, equal blame on the political parties who supported these turncoats in uh, contrast to what the general public had, uh, uh, had chosen. Yeah? So as far as I'm concerned, and I think many of uh, my uh, uh, colleagues are concerned, uh, PAS and AMNO are equally responsible for the formation of a government which does not represent the mandate of the Malaysian public and they are responsible for the existence of a very weak and uh, a very weak government that is completely clueless as to what it wants to do because they are a coalition based on numbers not based on manifesto they do not know they do not have any common agenda besides that of uh, forming a government and denying uh, a government to uh, Pakatan Harapan. Yeah? So as far as what we can see, uh, the question that, uh, that's uh, posed by the uh, topic, uh, we do not know or we do not see any uh, alternative to uh, political parties participating in general elections. But what is important is that for all the parties to uh, put forward candidates who are uh, who have integrity, who uh, will respect the decision of uh, the voters, and uh, equally so, uh, this must also be shown by all the political parties once they have been, uh, 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 once they are, uh, they've lost the elections, they are opposition, uh, they should respect uh, the decision of uh, the Malaysian voters. Uh, whether the uh, Recall elections is the most effective instrument to penalize the party hoppers. This is another issue which is uh, written in the summary. Uh, I think, yes, that's the way to go for anybody who wants to leave the party and has a, a different agenda uh, from what was promised to the voters uh, in, during the election. Uh, they should resign. Then they should recontest the seat with a new manifesto and exposing or explaining to the general public and to the voters what they now believe in and what they want to do. And if they can win the election again uh, on this new ticket and on this new agenda, then obviously uh, they have the moral uh, right to uh, say that uh, I represent my voters. Yeah? I represent the electorate. I represent the people within my constituency. But for as long as they do not do that, then it's obvious that they have actually gone against what they promised and uh, the uh, voters will definitely punish them in the next general election if we ever see one. Yeah? Because uh, as you all know, we're currently in a funny state of emergency. Uh, it's an emergency where, uh, nothing, can, where nothing is uh, different except for the fact that the parliament uh, does not sit. Yeah, so uh, just now my, the moderator said that he has no job. I have a job, but I can't perform my job. Yeah? I, I'm an MP, I'm a member of parliament, but the parliament is closed yeah? uh, until further notice. Yeah? So I think uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned, uh, what uh, we have learned from this uh, uh, rather uh, sad episode is that uh, the next general election uh, you must uh, put forward candidates who are committed to the party agenda and will perform and hold onto their promises. The next general election will be a campaign against uh, party hoppers, uh, political traitors, and those who support them. So, which includes, of course, AMNO and PAS. Yeah, okay. uh, because if they did, if they were not supported by AMNO and PAS, they wouldn't be able to form a government. Anyway, right. thank you. Thank you so much. Can I have appreciation? We're forced to forced to clap. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, in Malaysia, we are not forced to do anything. But sometimes we need a bit of a motivation because apparently, politician doesn't need motivation to hop and jump. Uh, 
So, YB Khalid made the point about integrity not of only individuals for what happened with the Sheraton move, but also the integrity of the political parties existing right now and making up the chess pieces on the board of our local politics. But when he said pass and I'm not, he turned and looked at me. Not only am I jobless, I'm partyless. For the career that I wanted, I cannot and did not join any political party. I don't have pass on stage, but I'm not, it's a bit further on my left. But before that and before he answers, he is the information chief. He has been practicing law since the last century. That's how long I've known of YB Senator Yusmadi. And now he's a senator and uh, he has been an MP. He's very, very passionate about advocating for rights. And he's done that globally, trying to network parliamentarians across the region and the world. So YB Yusmadi, if you're not making any coalition deal with YB Samad here, can you please give us six minutes of your thoughts on the topic? Yes, please clap. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I would not have a job, even moderating. Okay, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Audio, is the mic Hello? on? Can you hear me? All right. Yes. Uh, thank you, Kamaru. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks, organizer, for inviting me. Excellencies, when I see the title of the forum, I ask myself, what is the underlying issues behind this question? Is it because of the Sheraton move? Is it because of uh, we're not happy with our vote, assuming we have voted uh, A, B, C, and then suddenly the A, B, C change their stance, change their camp, or is it more than that? Accidentally, in 2013, I was invited to speak in Strasbourg on World Democracy Forum. At that time, the theme was the distrust of representative democracy. People start talking about it. And of course, at that time, I was recently elected, 2008. Uh, I was in parliament in the, in the lower house, now I'm in the upper house. So it posed me a serious question why in Europe at that time people are talking about the distrust to representative democracy whereby in Malaysia we just started what 60 years since 1957 more or less why and then I see the surrounding facts around it especially among the Scandinavian country you see in Sweden and also in German as well not necessarily Scandinavian in Switzerland there is emergence of what we call it direct democracy or in different contexts, they call it liquid democracy. And of course, you may have parties like pirate parties. Party penyamun. Kalau kita dengar kat Malaysia, pirate party, it sounds like a joke. But it is a serious party. They have elected representative. They have their own specific issues. Of course, most of their issues are urban issues. They fought for privacy rights. They fought for uh, property rights. They fought for... Uh, very urban oriented issues so my questions uh, at least today from my point of view the topic actually forced me to think further what's the purpose of political party in the first place b b before we, we, we can, can and talk whether it's essential or not so for the first round I think I have to be honest with a bit of humility to say look here is political party doing a good job for the last 60 years assuming I take the promise of the independence janji kemerdekaan at least in the declaration of independence I can extract a few of course it says among others yes this country will be built based on constitutional monarchy yes this country will be, will be using a parliamentary democracy but for what at least to achieve among others dia panggil apa prosperity kesejahteraan dan keamanan prosperity and apa ni peaceful country but in between there are guiding principles it has to be based on justice liberty democracy and freedom so my question is this has political party succeed in delivering this i term it as public goods 
For example, if I go further, Datuk Sri Anwar was talking about eradication of poverty, public health. Uh, just now, Kamaru was talking about how you create nexus between someone like him, who is now unemployed. I think he can easily get a job. I think he's highly qualified. It's a matter of choice, I think. And lost his beloved one. So how, how do you connect that nexus between political party who's supposed to think his aspiration, which he channeled at least once in four years, in four years through political party? Are we saying that is, is, is irrelevant. I think it is relevant. Because in different contexts, I have to say, people see uh, irrelevancy of political party. Okay, I, 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 I go for example, I, I come from Balik Pulau. I see there are other institutions doing a better job than political party. For example, people are still struggling on property rights in the countryside where people see, look, we have changed government, but yet, for this political party to face market economy, they are helpless. Pasrah. In fact, sometimes they become the cause to the problem, especially when we are not solving the very underlying problems of political finance. How, for example, how political party uh, become too dependent to their political donors, to the extent they cannot even stand independently firm on behalf of the poor marginalized. And then when I see there are other institutions like it can be lawyers, it can be bar council, it can be NGOs who become more effective than political party on the ground. So for me, this question is not just a, a simple question just to determine whether we need political party or not. I mean, for, for, for a new democracy in Malaysia, at least based on my limited uh, studies, at least we have more than 500 level of democracy. In the study of democracy in Malaysia, we are known as competitive authoritarian. What does it mean? We are good in using democratic institutions to transact our interests. Do we have a uh, judiciary? Yes. Do we have uh, election commission? Yes. Do we have anti-corruption commission? Yes. Do we have media? Yes. But we are also good in using it for our authoritarian purpose. At least Steve Levinsky agree with that. He wrote about it. So, for the first round, for me, I want to go a step, uh, slightly deeper to say that, look here, we have to decide now. Because I know on the ground, at least uh, Kamarul, from, from my limited observation interaction, every time when there, there, there is frustration, there are a group of people, so-called independents, say, look here, you smuddy. Next election, we're going to go uh, on our own. But it's, it was not happening, at least. I mean, Khalid, Wabi Khalid may know better than me because he's more senior than me in uh, partisan politics. Most of the time, most of the time, the independents will come and tell us, you smarty, we're fed up with your political party. I say, fine, let's, let, 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 let's come together. At least, you, assuming you don't have the missionary to do it in the rural area, let's try to offer alternative uh, options in the urban area. But it was not happening. But I can tell you, in 2008, when I was about to contest, there, are, there were uh, indication of interest, not only from my party, there are also party like PRM, Party Rakyat, to offer their services in Balik Pulau. But I have to give credit, they won in 1960s, 1969. Just to say that kampung people uh, not well aware of political options, political choices, I don't think so. People of Balik Pulau, as early as 60s, have decided something, I would say, uh, uh, in a way, quite radical for, for, for Malaysian standard at that time. So, uh, on that note, uh, apa dini, Kamarul, I think this question, I agree with you, is not a simple question. I have the humility to admit, we have to come to think together and see what will happen at the end of this forum. Thank you so much. Yes, you guys are getting better. Malaysia has hope. Thank you, Ismadi. Um, he only agrees with me after I'm jobless. When I was the editor-in-chief, we fought on many, many issues, even live on air. But they called him YB Astro Awani at one time. So that's why the last five to six years, we started changing to younger generation. One of them is this guy that I'm going to introduce next. 
Saudara Syahril, I'm so proud. I am declaring it publicly here that when, you know, it's not easy to be in charge of a newsroom. You look at the, all the political power play and then you look at your responsibility towards every Malaysian. But Saudara Syahril gave me some hope because he was very young then, he's still young now. But maybe we shall would have knocked us all out of the park because she's the youngest in Don Slango. But um, for somebody so young to espouse something so deep, that's profound. Not only on television, but for every single Malaysian. So, Saudara Sharia, six minutes is yours. Make us a believer. Well, you really built me up to fall. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Uh, Saudara Kamarul, thanks for the very, very kind words. Uh, YB Khalid, YB Senator Yusmadi, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I see uh, that to Sri Anifah as well in the audience. Thanks for uh, popping by and making this a little bit more nerve-wracking. I'm only kidding. I don't get nervous. But I will say this, um, you know, usually in forums like this, I try to stay above the fray uh, and engage with the topic. And I will try to do so, despite uh, certain provocations from the first speaker. I will, though, agree with both speakers and with Kamarul himself when I say that the topic, with apologies to the organizer, sounds like a curious misnomer because the answer is patently yes. Obviously, political parties are an essential part to democracy and to parliamentary democracy especially. But I suppose that the spirit of the topic is driven by a cynicism uh, that Malaysians feel towards political parties in more recent times. And maybe that's what uh, we're here to speak about. Because while partisanship endures and hardcore supporters of whatever political party uh, will remain steadfast in their beliefs about uh, the team that they support, there seems to be a growing sense in my mind that among the undecided voters and even among the more moderate supporters of political parties, there seems to be a sense that our politics is broken. Uh, I think a corollary sentiment emerges, uh, which is best encapsulated by the throwaway comment that we hear more often now than before, which is that small party politics are more. Uh, all political parties are the same. Or all politicians are the same. It's a comment that none of us on stage would want to rush to agree to. Obviously, we don't want to say that all politicians are the same. Neither do we want to rush to agree with the idea that all political parties are the same, because that would strike at the power, the appeal, had given the reason for why we associate ourselves with any one side. But the claim sticks and the cynicism is real. Uh, and I think it would be foolish for us to suggest otherwise. What has birthed this cynicism? What has driven it to the point where uh, there's so much discontent and frustration. And for somebody slightly younger than the two gentlemen to my right, it's, uh, <laughs> I had to throw that in. Uh, I suppose it's a bit more important because not just as a politician, but perhaps as a Malaysian, I want to be involved in politics one form or another for decades. I don't think in five-year horizons. I want to think in 50-year horizons. And if this thing is not fixed, uh, then whatever careerist ambitions I might have or anybody else might have will be, you know, for naught. And, you know, it won't actually mean anything in the grand scheme of things. So I think briefly, what's birth this, and I, I had some thought on the way here, and I, I feel that there are, you know, about seven things that I wanted to lay out in the introductory remarks for perhaps further discussion. One is reason number one in my mind is the defeated expectations from people about Pakatan Harapan, uh, which sits in stark juxtaposition with uh, the, the great hope that followed their success on 9th May, 10th May 2018. 
And I think you can't, you know, this is, you can't under, sorry, you can't uh, overstate this. Because the, whatever our feelings were, and obviously I had a very personal experience of it, losing my seat by such a big margin, congratulations to PH. Uh, whatever personal feelings, even I felt the day after, a certain level of, I can't say pride, and I'm not going to say it live, right? Uh, but a certain level of, you know, actually, no, it was pride. It was pride that Malaysia was able to change government quite so peacefully, that Malaysia uh, had proved to the world a, a, a ruling coalition that had been there from the beginning could actually be unseated. So there was a certain level of hope, even for me, even for me who uh, obviously didn't want it to happen. But what followed after, I think, uh, without going too deeply into it, um, the defeated expectations among the people were real, and I think that's reason number one. And as I go through these reasons, uh, they are, you'll see they're not mutually exclusive because, you know, obviously some feed into an, the other. The second reason, I feel, is the increased infighting within previously stable coalitions. Uh, that is true and was true especially for Pakatan when they were in government. I suspect it might still be true today. It's definitely true for the Prikatan National Coalition today, as you would have seen in the last couple of days. Reason number three is the Sheraton move. Um, however we assign blame, I will have a different reading from why we call it about how we assign the blame. It almost is a given that that incident didn't help uh, inspire confidence in political parties, in politicians, in integrity, as Wabi Khalid said, and I completely agree. Reason number four, Sheraton or not Sheraton, party hopping in general, has been super rife over the past few years, and it has never been so consequential as it has been this past couple of years. So, you know, hopping has happened, let's not be naive about it, but this time, or this round, this Bengal, kesannya cukup cukup, cukup besar lah, cukup jelas. Uh, reason number five that I've listed is politicians' behavior and statements, whether in the press or more consequentially perhaps because of coverage in parliament. And uh, I think this is true even for my own party, where you know remarks that are made which, again, don't inspire confidence that your elected representatives are there due to their knowledge of how to fight for your uh, agenda or how to better build the country. Uh, but what you see in viral videos are remarks and statements and you know, utterances uh, which, which are you know, not commensurate to the title Yang Berhormat. Reason number six, I feel, is also a lack of quality policy making and or policy execution, without going into too much detail into it, because I think everyone gets that. Uh, people no longer look up to the political class as, uh, you know, the class that is going to help make your life better. There's, a, again, the cynicism, the, the, the feeling that it's not like before. It is anecdotal, I'm, I'm just going off the cuff here, but masa kecil dulu, when we were younger, and I was just having a chat about this with a friend. Masa kita kecil dulu, kalau kita tengok menteri, civil servants, um, just the, the, the infrastructure of government lah, right? The economy of government. Kita mungkin tak faham what is happening, tapi kita rasa dia orang buat something. There was a feeling, there's a, there's a visceral feeling that yeah, they're, they're just better at what they're doing and I might not get it. I might not get wawasan 2020. I might not get what uh, inflasi sifar was. I might not get what uh, any number of you know, slogans or, or campaigns on TV was about. But I have a certain level of trust that they are smarter than me or my parents and more qualified to do what we've tasked them to do. I don't think that feeling exists today. Kalau cakap pasal menteri, the the first words that come to mind isn't that lah. So that's, uh, I think, a consequence of lack of uh, good policy-making execution. The last reason I've listed, which I think underpins everything, is the hypocrisy uh, that exists in politics. And I say this with obviously some risk because I am one political actor myself. Um, but I think we have to admit 
YB Khalid, uh, YB Yusmadi, that there's a group, I mean, hypocrisy exists anywhere in life. If you are a tribal person in a field, i.e. sekarang ni, tribalism lah, we are a party member, of course there'll be bias. Of course I will not see things or advertise how I see things the same way uh, if it you know, hurts or helps the image of the team that I'm with. So I'm happy to admit that, and I think we all have to. But the level of hypocrisy, I think, over the past few years has reached a certain level in which it's so naked and it's so blatant. The same people who say A today say B tomorrow. Uh, the same party who attack a certain narrative then uses that narrative then be so. Uh, you know, and, and vice versa. So I think that that, that growing sense is very hard to put in words. Uh, that's the, the level of... Um, uh, uh, frustration that comes from, I think, the, the, the hypocrisy and the excessive bias that political actors and their supporters uh, say. And I, I don't claim to be completely innocent of this, but I think it's important to, to lay out that as one reason. So, just to conclude, before I take too long, uh, a few suggestions. I think, A, to solve this, we need anti-hopping legislation, you know, recall elections. I saw an article the other day, a menu of options, so happy to speak about that, but I think that's one uh, thing to do. Second, I feel that there's a need for regeneration in the personnel uh, that make up political parties, ones that are less likely to make funny remarks, ones that are less likely to f be so personally invested in you know, personal battles that have gone on for decades. I was, I've, been said, I, I've said this in the past, the main political actors on the Malaysian stage are still the same people who have hurt each other so deeply that it's probably impossible to have any sincere or genuine a conversation between uh, parties that they represent. That's just my, my feeling, and I think regeneration, nobody disagrees with that. Three, political education for political class, not just for, the, not just for the masses, but also for the political class, so that they have a certain level of quality when they become our elected reps. And lastly, more bipartisan um, efforts, not just at the top, but all the way down to the grassroots level, uh, so that we can better uh, improve our politics and make it more hopeful. I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much. See, I don't have to ask you to clap anymore. So if it's the 15th time that the memory, institutional memory of our country to vote, how many times do we have to be fooled by any hypocrite politicians? So that's the question, right? But it's not that simple. A lot of points in the seven that was put by Shahril, a more developed democracy, a more powerful society like America, they were grappling with Trump until now. And thanks to Ezra Wani, over 15.5 years, I've interviewed 14 Nobel laureates, ex-politicians, senators, whatever. But the point is, institutional reforms, that's what I want to make. So if the question is that, if we look at political parties as institutional, have there been reforms? Why do we keep hearing the same things over and over again? Money politics, hopping. I'm a journalist for 25 years. The same things, just different actors, different settings. So in this second round, which has begun, I would like to start with that, but as I promised, and I cannot be like what we are lamenting, right? Hypocrisy. <laughs> I need to stand to my word. I want to take in views or comments from the ladies because you guys are not represented on stage. Any that want to go and give a point? I'm giving you democracy practice right here as compared to certain institutions. Going once, twice, yes. Thank you so much. The usual rules, please state your name and who or which organization. But if you are jobless and unaffiliated like me, it's okay also. Please, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Liana Kairudian from the British High Commission, Kuala Lumpur. Um, so I'm going to take you at your word, Kamaro. Uh, and I have two questions for the esteemed panelists. Uh, the first one is... As you all know, politics is actually a mix of identity and ideology. Uh, we have three Malay gentlemen on stage, um, uh, each from three supposedly very different political parties. 
can you actually tell us what is the identity and the ideology that your parties represent? My second question is actually what Kamaro just alluded to, the patronage system. Political parties exist because we need money to fund politics. The dependency of patronage system in Malaysia is entrenched. How does either of you or your political parties plan to empower the voters in addition to probably keeping your politics alive? Thank you. Um, please pardon me. I'm, I'm, I might still be suffering from long COVID, but I don't know because MOH from the very first day never put me in their treatment list or even contacted me. Uh, what was your name again? Liana Kairudin. Liana Kairudin. So I will always remember your name because you, Lia, so because you took out the challenge. Um, uh, soalan pertama tu semenit je boleh tak? Because I know you can take a whole night and the night after that to talk about ideology. All three of you. Just the first question first and just one minute ish. Because Wabi's Khalid cakap, you know, you can start dulu, second round, so please. Can, can, can. Uh, thank you. Lia, was it? Yeah. Leah. Thanks for the question. Uh, what's our party's identity and ideology? Um, so, I, I won't give you the, the textbook answer dalam satu minit. I'll just say that the ideology of AMNO is, uh, in general speak, uh, about how to further the economic uh, and political interests of the majority Malay community while also uh, ensuring that Malay leadership is respected and accepted and celebrated by other ethnic communities. Now, within that general statement, there are a million ways of how you would go about that. You could go about it in Malay supremacist ways, which I don't subscribe to. You could go in more moderate ways, which is the way that I would uh, agree with. So, one minute, right? Terus number dua. Seminit dia. Oh, soalan number dua. Tambahlah seminit, yuk. Soalan number dua pasal patronage tu. Oh, so patronage was, I think if I understood the question correctly, Lia, it was about how we... Uh, ensure we take care of the interests of the people uh, and not just our... How do you change that? La, the patronage how do you change the patronage? Yeah, uh -huh. So, patronage within parties. Uh, yeah, so that's, if, if I understood it correctly and I apologize if I didn't. Um, for AMNO, I think this idea of patronage is probably more pronounced la, in AMNO compared to other parties because they're party yang lama, uh, party yang ada a lot of structure and hierarchy within it. Uh, how do you manage? So for me, uh, how, what I do is uh, I ensure that the ideas that my friends and I bring within the party are strong enough and are appealing enough that even elder statesmen or other you know, less complimentary terms that have been used about more elder members of the party can accept them. So you have to somehow find ways to convince them that there is an ins intrinsic and an instrumental logic to whatever you're pushing. Uh, I think that, that part is important for me to stress. So, kadang-kadang you go into politics as a young person with a lot of, yeah, you should have a lot of beliefs, ideals, what you're passionate about. But when you enter a, a, a terrain like AMNO, uh, you quickly realize that to convince them, you have to give an instrumental reason as to why they should support this. So, I'll give you a specific example. I'm one of the people who will continue to tell my AMNO colleagues that it is silly, foolish and wrong for us to say that non-Malay votes are out the door and we don't care about non-Malays. We should only focus on getting the Malay votes. There's an intrinsic, intrinsic belief as to why that is so. Lah. And I don't think I need to convince a crowd like this here why. Tapi, for my AMNO colleagues, I have to tell them instrumental logic. Lah. I have to tell them that you do the maths, are you going to win 90% of the Malay votes everywhere? No, you're not. So therefore, you need this. So, so that's the kind of you know, more tactical things that I have to, I have to do uh, to complement the intrinsic reasons why we believe certain things. So I hope that helps. Lia, yeah. Clubhouse. They explained that panjang lebar. Malam tu dua jam, I dengar. Clubhouse hours. malam, nak tidur. <laughs> um, sorry. sorry, my name is Liana. Liana, Liana sorry. sorry, I do apologize. Um, and I'm an Android user. So there is also an issue of elitism with Clubhouse. Understood. I agree. But you can do my way. I'm a jobless person. I put four more every time on my timeline. And the community raised and gave me an iPad. 
and now I have to be on Clubhouse. So there are more ways than one to skin a cat or a politician or a political party. Why be use Madi? Over to you. Uh, Lena, thanks for the questions. I can uh, put in a very uh, normative uh, answer. Uh, my party is a multiracial party. We not, uh, belong to a communal party. Because that alone, I have to put it uh, in a bold manner because of it's not easy. Yeah, we, we established in 1990. Uh, it started, of course, as a, uh, with a social, social justice movement, Gra Adil, and evolved in 1999, become Parti Keadilan National. And now it became Parti Keadilan Rakyat. So the, the, the very, if you were to say about uh, ideological normative stance, of course, we are for democracy. And of course, you are talking about I'm not here to say that whether we are for market economy or less market economy, but based on what Dr. Shawn Abraham said just now, it tells you the very essence of what party stands. Yes, we, we can support any form of market economy. We are for limited governments. But if you ask me what is my idea of uh, governments, number one, it has to be effective governments, the governments which deliver public goods. Number two, it has to be based on the rule of law whereby when I say rule of law, there's no such institution which above it. If there is such institution above it, it's a rule by law. That's why we have to be very clear. That's why today, when, when, when we have a situation where, where the, the citizens feel that, look here, there are other institutions which above them. Of course, I say this with due respect to <laughs> Yarif here. <laughs> uh, my Arif, uh, Dato, uh, ma. Uh, because this, this notion is very important. So I think when I say rule of law, I'm very careful it's not rule by law. Because whether it's, a, whether it's really well understood in the, in, 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 uh, in the public domain, yes or no. But at least we see something is happening and we fall for it. And lastly, of course, I also fall something which is a step further, which when I see when democracy is not delivering for, for, for many reasons, for populism, for whatever reasons, we have to go a step further, what I call it democratic accountability, is what Dr. Sui said. Because when, when you say that, only then you see the very idea of democracy has meaning. So whether, uh, uh, how should I frame it in terms of uh, labeling? I mean, it's not easy. Uh, frankly speaking, when we started uh, this party, our party, I have to say, it represents so many people. It represents scholars, it represents uh, bureaucrats, it represents uh, entrepreneurs, it represents even certain, so I call it sovereign individuals. It can be imam, it can be padri, but they are equally important. Uh, should I go for the second question? Let me add a flavor to that second okay. question. So Abno obviously has it tougher. They are longer and bigger. But uh, just after two decades, for your party, has any of the patronage perception out there any merits? Or is the people's justice ideology pervading from the top to the bottom for PKR? Okay, uh, it is a very a difficult question because the word patronage itself is not very easy to, to explain for me I, I give for example are we talking about when we have a, 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 let's say a certain certain patron at, at certain level say, say, say for example there, there are uh, a, a rich individual or corporate figures say that I, I'm for for your ideals I'm for for your cause is that considered uh, uh, patronage so, but for me, what I concern very much is a political patronage where it stops you from pursuing the very ideals of your party idealism. For example, for example, my party, I know, uh, we are very much concerned about the poor, actually those at the fringe, but the day when we, f we are facing with the reality, somehow I find to fight against market economy, which most of the time... Uh, fail us, it's not easy. But of course, for me uh, to address that, it can, it, it's not one way, uh, uh, one silver bullet. Huh? At least the way I look at it, it has to start from, from, a, from a big picture, from the rule of law, for example. Of course, now we are talking about uh, political finance, we are talking about anti-hopping law, and of course, uh, whether all these things happening now, not yet in place. But I see hope, for example, at least now we are in parliament now, despite all the hoping, uh, th th there are YBs from uh, uh, both sides of the houses. Okay. We formed together, we set up 
uh, caucus for electoral reform. There are YB Padarengas, there are YB Tenggara, who is currently serving minister, uh, and myself, and of course, there are PAS also, YB Dr. Awang from Pendang, and of course, we have uh, Jori Abdul from okay. uh, Ni, and we are also from Amana. Mm -hmm. So for me, while we are uh, looking at uh, so many, I would say, disappointment, but at least there are some things uh, happening. And of course, we did discuss what uh, the moderator said, whether should we go for recall, whether we should go for uh, anti-hopping law. Things are in, 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 the, in the discussion. YB? Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. I'm uh, from uh, Pati Amana, Negara. Uh, the uh, moderator translated that as the uh, National Trust Party. Actually, uh, we prefer the National Integrity Party uh, because Amanah uh, means uh, to have integrity. Uh, you hold to your uh, promises, you hold to your trust, you hold to uh, whatever responsibility that uh, has been given to you. And uh, it's, uh, this party was originally uh, from the Islamic party uh, history. It's from past. There were 18 of the 24 Central Committee members uh, of PAS uh, who were, uh, how do you say, uh, dropped during the 2015 party elections uh, because the uh, Dewan Ulama or the scholars uh, came out with a list of names which did not include uh, 18 incumbents. And the reason why the 18 incumbents were dropped is because we were opposed to the idea of PAS uh, working with uh, AMNO and leaving uh, Pakatan Rakyat, which of course at that point in time, the leadership was uh, denying, uh, but in the end, uh, I mean, it's quite clear now that they were uh, moving in that direction. And uh, to us, it was part of uh, the issue of uh, integrity to be a party or a member of Pakatan Rakyat because we had just finished the uh, 2013 election with uh, Pakatan Rakyat and we won the elections on the ticket or on the uh, issues of uh, 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 Pakatan Rakyat, which the manifesto that Pakatan Rakyat brought. So when uh, PAS wanted to move in the opposite direction, we left and we thought that that was uh, completely irresponsible and immoral and unethical uh, for PAS to do so. Obviously, uh, the party has a different uh, side of the story. They say that we are the ones who uh, won based on the party's uh, logo, and we are the ones who are therefore uh, uh, betrayed the trust of the party members. But uh, we, look, uh, we look at it uh, from a different angle. So as far as our uh, party ideology is concerned, it's still uh, basically uh, Islamic uh, based, uh, but we are multiracial and multi-religious and our party membership is open to all. We take the Islamic principles uh, the political uh, Islamic principles from a uh, very uh, centrist uh, and universal uh, perspective. And uh, when we were in PAS, we brought the, uh, uh, the slogan of PAS for all, uh, which obviously is uh, not what PAS is now. Yeah? And uh, as far as uh, the economy, uh, political ideology and all that, that I think is uh, quite common. It's uh, uh, basically belief in uh, democracy and uh, uh, it's an open market with obviously uh, government uh, intervention in certain areas. So uh, I don't think we need to go into that in detail. Uh, as far as patronage is concerned, uh, we are a new party, so we, have not, we, have, we don't have that problem. Uh, we were in the government and there were uh, members who uh, did uh, give a contribution, but uh, the contribution we insisted would, should be anonymous and just uh, pump in into our uh, party account without any... Uh, 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 strings attached. Uh, we think that the issue of uh, political funding should be addressed, uh, but obviously it's something that needs a two-thirds majority in the parliament, and I don't think that parties who are enjoying patronage today uh, would want uh, to see uh, political funding being uh, institutionalized and uh, made uh, practice, uh, because then they would uh, lose the uh, financial uh, advantage of have, having uh, the patrons, while the newer parties uh, do not. Uh, in particular, the opposition parties do not. I think uh, this is a uh, political reality and uh, it should be uh, handled uh, by uh, a, a more responsible uh, attitude by all uh, parties. What we want is to see a thriving and healthy uh, democracy, not one that's being uh, 
uh, dominated by uh, economic elites uh, through uh, uh, patronage for political parties. Why we just because of you and uh, integrity? There's a lot of fear in the diverse and multicultural, multi-faith society like Malaysia, when there's an Islamic party, for example, then the next phrase would be political Islam, for example. So can you add a bit of that angle to, to Liana's question? Yeah, that fear is what we aim to address because we believe that the uh, misrepresentation of the Islamic uh, political uh, ideology is something which is uh, very unfortunate. And PAS actually was originally on, the, uh, on the, a more centrist path and uh, because of that, it was able to work together with Kaadilan and the DAP. Uh, but obviously now it's uh, no longer just uh, uh, religious extremism, but also uh, some form of uh, racial uh, right-wing uh, kind of uh, uh, ideology which uh, PAS is uh, pursuing. And uh, this was uh, part of the reason why we felt that we had to leave and form a new party uh, even though we realize that we will be battling against a very well-established and deeply entrenched uh, political institution, particularly uh, within the uh, rural areas. But uh, I think we are making uh, uh, substantial progress and cool. uh, the recent surveys yes. that uh, were undertaken by Sina, ha Sina Harian and uh, Chin, uh, Sin Chu Jitpo uh, okay. placed us uh, almost at par with PAS in terms of uh, <laughs> public support. But obviously, that uh, survey did not differentiate between races. So uh, we can assume, uh, most probably, uh, uh, PAS had uh, purely Malay uh, kind of uh, support, oh, yeah. uh, while uh, we would have uh, a majority Malay support, uh, but uh, maybe some uh, non-Malay uh, support. We have quite a few non-Malays and non-Muslims as our members. So heading towards the last leg of the run in this discourse, it's very clear that the answer is yes, political parties are essential in a parliamentary democracy, especially like Malaysia. The question is, look deeper and wider, have they delivered on all the questions and all the political science 101 tasks of what political, political parties are supposed to do? And when push comes to shove, it's not about the tough gets going. This is a pandemic era. So you hold politicians and political parties even more because they are the ones who make decisions and control the resources. Either way, whether you're in government or not in government, that's why not just politicians who are with the government that gets the jab, the opposition, politicians also get the jab. I fought so hard for journalists to be acknowledged as frontliners and to get the jab, but this country, it doesn't think so. So my fellow journalists out there, even some in here, they have to go out daily to the frontiers and yet they are not protected. So those are the things that we want politicians and political parties to be accountable for. But before I go, as long as I'm handing out positive affirmation, one for gender, the other must be for geography and history. It's always that Sabah and Sarawak and the Borneo side of Malaysia I talk about less in this kind of gathering because we are geographically here. But my bate is a poor kubu motif bate of Sarawak. It's on purpose. I do have the power to select what I wear and I want to represent symbolically the other side of Malaysia, which is actually for me more essential in whether we go forward better or not. Datuk Sri Anifa, with all due respect, can I ask for any Sabahan or Sarawakian? You get a chance at the mic because I am the moderator. Going once, twice, yes. Please go to the mic or can we get the mic to him? Technical guys, yang baik hati, yes. Hello. One question only. Eh? Positive information pun ada limit now. <laughs> Hello. Yes, okay. yes, we can hear you. Please state your uh, name and where you come from. Hi, my name is Derek. Uh, I don't know if Brother Kabaru knows me or not. I think he knows, but yeah. So I'm from Sarawak, but I've been uh, living here for almost 10 years. 
Um, my question would be, um, is basically, we can see the stark contrast between Sarawak political landscape and um, West Malaysian political landscape, whereby uh, as a Sarawakian from our lands, we can see that uh, race-based politics is still very much entrenched. Whereas in Sarawak, we don't really, yes, we talk about race, but not in a large, you know, not in a larger scale. Yeah? So the dynamics is totally different. Now, the key question here is, as Sarawak is part of Malaysia, how do we actually progress further, you know, in terms of um, um, our political dynamism, meaning that, you know, how do we actually be more inclusive as a political party? Okay. Because, because the, the reason why I'm saying this is because a political party, normally in West Malaysia, they are the dominant party yes. that is going to be part of the government. Yeah? Okay. Thanks. Derek, right? Yeah, Derek. Yeah. Okay. I add one more layer because you talk about Sarawak, but we also have an interesting scenario to look at because Sarawak, unlike Sabah, Sabah, the Semenanjung based party, has really gone in in a big way. But for Sarawak, they largely are still their own ecosystem from that sense. So I'm just layering that on top of what Derek said. Any takers? All your parties want to be great in Borneo also, right? No, I'm just saying. Anyone? Okay, go ahead. Not for this. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 uh, not to say that I have an answer for, for a very important question, but uh, accidentally, uh, my, my name is Yusmadi, actually, my father was in Sabah. He was army. He chose to die. He fought. Of course, halfway, he came back to Penang. Then I asked my mom, why my name is Yusmadi? It's not so Penang. <laughs> it sounds a bit Javanese. But then suddenly I find out, no, at that time, before you were born, uh, I, my mom's supposed to fly to Sabah. But then somehow, it didn't happen. But still, my father sent telegram, no, your name has to be Yusmadi. And when I study law, then I find the case law. PP Lawan Yusmadi. <laughs> it was accused. Then I know that I'm from, some, somehow it originated from Sabah. The reason why I ask this question because from day one, when we set up our political party, I did ask my boss, Dr. Shana Ibrahim, why you work so hard to build a political party which has branches, divisions, from Perlis up to Sabah, Sarawak. Why can't we just follow a successful model of AMNO for, for, for that matter? Because they are just uh, very strong in Semenanjung, if I correct me, I'm wrong, because this is a Ketua Penerangan. But why you put the trouble to work so hard to be a political party uh, from Perlis up to Sabah, and are proudly uh, to put on record, we may be, uh, be sub, sub, sent to be corrected, uh, uh, Dr. Anifah, uh, the only party with that support system. So for me, at least we have shown we are here not to play another parochial original politics, at least from, from physical Compared attack. to? Huh? Uh, I'm not here to compare. But, Shari, uh, I'm just going to yeah. pass it over to and, you. And my, my, my last point is this. Uh, while we are pushing for, for, for so-called universal uh, political dynamic, but I have to admit uh, somehow, while pushing from this side, suddenly something else comes from this side. For example, we, we, before this, we, we haven't heard outcry of Sarawak for Sarawakian, Sabah for Sabahan. I'm not seeing here whether it's a right or it's wrong, but the question is this, whether this is the answer for the very idea of federalism, bersekutu bertambah mutu. So, for me, that formula, bersekutu bertambah mutu, somehow has built this country to a certain extent. But the question is that, what is the new formula? What is the, the, the federalism 2.0? So for me, that question is, is somehow has to be put in that context. So at least from our political party, we try, but frankly speaking, not very successful. In Sabah, I have to admit, it's not easy. He knows most of them are our friends. We try former minister, Why? former, we're Why? not successful. Yeah? Why is it not so successful? Why I think... I think I may be wrong. Eh? Politics somehow very local at all level. Cultural? Very local. And I have, I have this word. In fact, I'm writing something on this. I say very parochial. Okay. When for me, and parochialism, I have to argue here, is more dangerous than racism. 
Okay. Racism, you can see it. Okay, kejap But lagi kita masuk racism. Paracritism is, is something very implicit. It Why? reflect about uh, your mindset, reflect how you see things, and I think we have to address kejap, that issue. Okay, kejap lagi we masuk. I have no choice, Sharia, because he said a few things, so I have to pass to you. <laughs> I thought you have all the power, and suddenly you have no choice. Democracy. <laughs> Uh, right, so I think to, to best respond to this, um, I did hear a clever remark from YB Khaled who said, you know, Sarawak is, uh, is better because Amnu tak ada kat Sarawak. <laughs> so, you know, can lah. I understand he needs to make the cheap shots, but that's fine. Uh, but honestly speaking, when you are a race-based party as Amnu is, obviously certain places are less welcoming. Let's put it out there. So there is a reason why Amno, whatever may have happened in the past, uh, including when your former ally was the president for 20 odd years, uh, wanted to enter Sarawak, we never did. And I don't think there's any desire to do that now. Uh, so there is an admission that uh, Amno politics, for as long as it defines itself the way we do now, you know, race-based, uh, membership, semua tu, uh, kalau bercakap selalu pasal politik kemelayuan, obviously it's less relevant in places like Sarawak. Okay. So, how, how we manage that difference is to not spread ourselves thin, if I may say so, the way PKR has, but to find alliances with parties that are local there. Uh, that's how BN yeah. was before and that's how you know, a configuration of that cooperation might still be able to exist. I am using my power to let him speak now. And sure. Answer. I have to respond to the cheap shot because it was not... It was your cheap shot, yes. which I advertised. <laughs> okay, okay, got it, got it. Uh, that I was uh, making uh, to uh, YB Yusmandi. Uh, but I think uh, Sharil uh, has got his facts wrong because uh, Amno is no longer supposed to be a Malay, uh, purely Malay-based party. It's supposed to be a Bumi Putra party. And if you talk about Bumi Putras, then of course in Sarawak you have quite a lot of Bumi Putras. And that's the reason why Sabah, uh, in the end, Amno entered uh, Sabah as well. So I think uh, the uh, over sh overriding uh, element of a Malay uh, dominance uh, is, uh, of course, a fact. And the reason why uh, they never got to Sab Sarawak was because it was not allowed by the late uh, uh, chief minister. Uh, but never mind. I think uh, what's important actually is that uh, Malaysian politics must move away yeah, from uh, being personality-centric to principle-centric. And this is what uh, we want to do. Um, I mean, this is a bit of a political okay. campaign, right? right. Uh, from uh, Parti Amanah, uh, because we are talking about integrity. Okay. We are very proud of the fact that uh, none of our MPs have uh, jumped ship as yet. Of course, we don't have as many, uh, but uh, all 11 are still uh, true to the party. And uh, there, there were some uh, movement uh, towards other uh, parties within the same coalition, but uh, I think uh, we have uh, nipped it in the bud, hopefully. Uh, but uh, the question of being principle-centric is very important. The problem in Sarawak, as I see it now, uh, probably as what uh, Yusmadi mentioned, is being parochial. Uh, uh, you know, there, is, there are these uh, giants or individuals which uh, manage to uh, obviously uh, become very powerful because they have a lot of money. And uh, Sarawak is the richest state in Malaysia and uh, the recent uh, two point over billion that's been given to the uh, by the federal government only increases its uh, uh, its wealth but unfortunately it's uh, settled with a very uh, big uh, problem of uh, poverty it's one of the po has having the highest uh, uh, percentage or numbers of uh, uh, poor in uh, Sarawak and this is our problem yeah Okay. Uh, just one last statement. Yeah. Those who say they are uh, pejuang Melayu lah, yeah. pejuang Melayu ni. Yeah. I just like to, and maybe Sharil can respond to this later. Pejuang Melayu have become rich, while the Malays are still poor, right? So I think okay. this is our problem because we are very personality uh, centric in our uh, politics, and we have to move away from that. We have to be more principle centric. Thank you. Personality centric, does that also apply to who should become PM? Yes. Because sometimes, <laughs> even as a journalist, when you say things like that, 
When I look at what's been spoken and negotiated and we cover tunggu sampai tengah malam waiter outside political party says quarters, it doesn't sound like that rules. Uh, I'm saying rules. I'm talking on behalf of Amana. Okay, so as fine. far as Amana, we are not too... But Amana does have a coalition, right? Uh, has have a... Coalition. Yeah, yeah. We are yeah. part of a coalition. Unfortunately, we are not the strongest within the coalition. Okay, okay point taken. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm moving on. There is nothing I fear more than waking up without a program that will help me bring a little happiness to those with no resources, those who are poor, illiterate, and ridden with disease. Put the COVID era into relevance here. Isn't that what you want from a politician? Right from a political party, but sadly, he is not a Malaysian. He is passed already. He is and was Nelson Mandela. The only politician I know in the world, despite being jailed for 27 years, here when we hear politician talking about being jailed, it's as if I now deserve this. When Nelson Mandela talk about being jailed, it meant that that's why I'm going for reconciliation. Is it? too much to us for politicians and political party to reconcile in a pandemic era that has killed many Malaysians. We are not a nation that goes to war. We have lost many to SARS-CoV-2. And yet, because they are essential, the weakness and the strength are together. Because they can, they are not aligning because they can fight. Each of the political parties have their own resources and strategies and targets. But can the people in a democracy make the political parties and politicians work together to deliver what they're supposed to deliver? Our, as you smartly put it, public good. I wasn't even in the radar of Ministry of Health. After I went to a COVID action center, for those who do not know what it is, that means in your district, there'll be the center point where you go and get cleared. I walk in myself, got cleared, five, sorry, three days after that, the contact tracing people called me to ask as if it's the first time they're talking to me. So as a journalist and a former editor-in-chief, when I look at the numbers being mentioned, how do I have trust? Why do you talk about integrity? Integrity of data in this day and age is very important. So if you don't map your data to the minute, can I trust you? And if you're not doing that, why? You have the whole resources of Malaysia. We're not poor. We might not be rich, but we are not poor in terms of resources. So now I'm putting it back to the political parties and their reps here. Why can't the political parties, for once only, come together, get the COVID, SARS-CoV-2 virus very, very manageable level, and then go, lah. election ke, or whatever it is. Can I ask that question? Would you want me to ask them to answer that? Who wants? Angkat tangan. Very democratic, are you all? Okay, okay. Banyak ni aja nak. Okay lah, tanya soalan lain lah. Okay, never mind. Do you want to take that question? I am happy to get to a point where we could work together. But how to work together when even on a floor like this, on a forum like this, every opportunity he gets, he takes a shot. Yeah. <laughs> that's that I mean, that's part of the job, lah. You know, my Khaled knows this and you know it's Politics, especially in Malaysia, is very performative, you know, so there's always stuff that we show and then, you know, maybe have a coffee afterwards and everything's not so uh, adversarial. But the point is, we need to incentivize the ability for people in political parties who want to work together. And I think I, I do. I think it's clear that whether it's on my social media, whether it's what I say in speeches, even on my party platform, whether it's places like this, that I express a desire that I want to. I express more frustration about my own party than most people. Lah. I can verify that. <laughs> Both in private and in public. Yes. But the temperature in our political system sekarang is the cynicism sampai satu level. Whatever comes out of Shari Hamdan's mouth doesn't matter because they are UMNO. 
Dia sampai level tu tau Syari cakap sense ke nonsense ke Tak kisah sebab so, dia UMNO So, so Yus Mahdi se- punya and kawan-kawan punya strategi Asalkan bukan UMNO, it works ha, until benda, now Benda-benda macam tu lah, dia, dia dapat, dia menang election Based, based on that, so well done to, for, to them for that, but the point is If we're talking seriously, we need to get to a point Where even if I have Discomfort about okay. Amanah Or about DAP, about PKR Tapi kalau the individuals, in the personnel In those parties, I have to judge Them based on their, on their own terms So what's the solution? So the solution you, the country is, needs it, right? Okay, the solution is I think some were contained in the stuff that I said, right? If there's regeneration in the personnel, if we're no longer led by personal agendas of individuals who are elderly in their age Got and it. also elderly in their experience of how they hurt each other. Let me put to you a hypothetical question. Sure. So if your generation goes up and hold power in Amno, uh, your <laughs> age group goes up and hold power in PKR. Sure. Uh, Amana, I, I, I really have met only two young leaders from them. So, do you think it will change? I think it became a lot easier. Especially if Uni 18 is in Especially practice. Especially if Uni 18 is there and people start pressuring politicians to talk about policy, okay. about COVID, about any number of things, then I think that it's impossible to okay. not work together. Because I want to represent the balance to the younger group also, so I want to uh, espouse this thought lines here for all three of you. It's not the point that besok UD18, they want to mengundi. It's the point yang if political parties and politicians represent everyone, including the aspiration of young people, then UD18 is just a process. But ideally, they are already represented. So the point is, because the political parties are essential, but within the political parties, phone the younger generation are not really given room, platform, empowerment, whatever you call it. So that reflects onto the nation. Hence why, tah bila in 2022 hujo, only then we're going to see undi 18, for example. You spoke out of it, I, I read it. So, is it impossible to hope for political parties to really put youth and young at the top in terms of uh, personnel or aspiration? I start from you first now. You and me among the oldest, they are younger than us. Uh, of course, uh, first I have to respond to uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. fair uh, enough. Okay, so go I'm, ahead. I'm very cynical because there's a lot to be cynical about. I mean, uh, right now you talk about COVID and we all know that this pandemic is being made use of in order to declare a state of emergency and to keep the government, in in, uh, the current government in power. And whether AMNO likes it or not, they are part of this conspiracy. They are using the COVID for all, uh, you know, statements of uh, otherwise. Uh, for their own personal and political uh, interests. So obviously there's a lot of things to be cynical about uh, because uh, there are a lot of things which are not not right. And AMNO is in a position to make sure that this government is brought down and to uh, put up a more responsible government because they are the ones who, while uh, they are, uh, what you say, uh, having their uh, uh, cake and eating it too, they are behaving like an opposition Complaining about Perikatan National, complaining about Mohyuddin, complaining about this, complaining about that. But they are the ones who are holding the government up. So of course I'm cynical. And I, can, uh, and I have every right to be uh, cynical because there are reasons. And uh, Asharil, uh, even though uh, uh, not of the same uh, generation, has to accept that uh, that's it politics. Was that's it was, we didn't fail. There were, when we were in government, there was a lot of racial and religious uh, propaganda that okay. was being made. If you answer my younger yeah. generation so question, question, we will go to the racial. To, okay, as far as the question of the younger generation is concerned, there's no problem as far as Amana is concerned. Uh, obviously, we are in support of the Undi 18. Uh, that also is another issue which the government had already passed. It was passed in parliament. It was passed by the Senate. And the current government is the one who is... Uh, you know, uh, delaying it uh, just as much as the uh, question of uh, the COVID. They are uh, making use of all these issues uh, in order to uh, prevent any form of reforms, uh, meaningful, meaningful reforms, to bring into the political arena a more uh, positive and a more vibrant democracy. Well, Sorry? PKR also has been 
debating about youth representation for, for the longest time, even before it was a full fledged political party, like you said, lah, social advocacy and stuff. But once it's over 20 over years now, sometimes when we talk Mr. about Chairman, PKR also, we talk about... Can we participate in a discussion? Can, can. Just a bit. Let me finish this a bit. Um, because there has been war here. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, are, are we still talking about this in parties? And it should be automatic, right? Youth representation, they are the one with innovation and stuff like that. But in parties, it's not that easy to do, even for PKR. Okay, uh, am I at liberty to even ask our dear friends to first question? Maybe, maybe related? Uh, okay, 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 with your indulgence. Um, when Alexis Tocqueville wrote about democracy in America years back, he was 25 years old. He, actually a French guy, visited America in nine months. And he articulated what's wrong with democracy in America. To the extent, he coined the word habits of the hearts, and the very idea of intermediaries, the role of intermediaries to the extent it give birth to political party, the idea of political party. Because the idea of political party was won strongly by the founding father, George, uh, George Washington himself. Because of this, because he, George Washington, foresee that it's going to be a serious, uh, 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 strong line uh, when you form political parties. But these are things. To answer your question indirectly, it took Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, the young, maybe they are 30s, to come together, one set up Federalists, one set up the Democratic Republican. But the point is this, what created the genius of U.S. Con uh, federa uh, uh, the genius of uh, United States uh, uh, Constitution is the work of a senior guy, at least in metam metaphorically, is Benjamin Franklin, the eldest, who collaborate together for a bigger picture agenda to unite the whole America with the early 30s, Jane Madison, Alexander Hamilton. So the way I look at it, what is needed in this country is the very wisdom of the seniors. I have to, I've seen him in parliament, foreign ministers. He, one thing I, I think I can cross paths with him, we, I'm also a United State player. He was managing uh, Sabah. The reason I say this is because we need to have a new model of leadership where the seniors can work together with the young. The reason I said so, I give you one example. In the one gara, one good day, one senator said from past, let's ban Tumblr. Tumblr. And then all the senators, because a, 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 a Senate typically meant for political rewards bef, be, before I joined, before I set up the, the caucus, the Senate reform, whatsoever. And then quietly they asked me, Ismadi, what is Tumblr? You are talking about to ban it, you know, the effect of it to freedom of speech whatsoever, yeah. but you are talking about to ban it and you are from the upper house. So me, like it or not, why uh, the young need to be represented, why the wise uh, elders with wisdom need to also to be represented, because the collaboration of this, the core competent, will create a new synergy for the higher purpose, bigger agenda of the character, of the country. Yes, but he never answered me directly, so, okay, over to the floor. Where's the gentleman just now? Yes. And anyone else, please be at the mics so that we just take about three first. Thank you. Uh, my name is James Ligunjang. I come from Sabah. I was formerly a member of the State Assembly. Uh, I would just like perhaps uh, to answer briefly what uh, is the essential part of the discussion. Uh, political parties essential in parliamentary democracy. I believe very much so that political parties are essential simply because it is the tenets of democracy to form a government. But what is important is it is not the party that is creating the problem. It is the people in the party that's creating the problem that's why if you look at the question there there seems to be underlying suspicion and cynicism towards political parties in Malaysia because there's a lot of mistrust because a lot of these politicians that we have are betraying the mandate of the people by their you know 
amphibious nature of switching from one party to another. And I think this is the uh, right time that Malaysia must legislate uh, enactment to prevent all this, so that prevent chaos in the country and instability of the government. So are you asking them whether they will support anti-hoping laws? Yes, and uh, the other thing that uh, I just want to share my perspective on what uh, one of the panelists mentioned about parochialism and racialism, that in Sarawak and in Sabah, we are more parochial. I think you have to understand the basis of that. We must understand how Malaysia was formed. Malaysia was formed on the basis of the Malaysia Agreement 1963. And I think a lot of uh, Malaysian uh, uh, who, who are in Malaya, they have their mindset, their political mindset is Malayan centrist and not Malaysia centrist. And I think that's a problem. We feel very much marginalized in a lot of uh, policies uh, that is enacted at the federal level. When the Malayan thinks about Malaysia, they only talk about the peninsula. They don't mind, they don't talk about the, the uh, Sabah and Sarawak so much. That's why a lot of, uh, if you go around in Sabah and Sarawak, they know every Malaysian in Sabah and Sarawak know when Malaysia was born. But look, you go to the villages here in Kampung, in Penang, wherever, even in Selangor, you go to Kampung Baru, ask any elderly there, when was Malaysia formed? A lot of them can't answer. They thought in 1957. And I think this is the problem. Why you notice that we are more parochial? Because it's the underlying uh, belief that we must serve the country together. That a point taken, I just in the interest of time wanting to link it back to the editorial line here. So what is the solution from your point of view? Is I, it a party from Sabah and Sarawak like... I think uh, we should come together and really... How? Really study the, the formation of the country. Okay. Would it make it better if Parti Cinta Sabah, Warisan, PBB, Parti Cinta Malaysia, um, any party that is now or future originating from Borneo but becoming national be the best way to change that equation? Not really. Uh, the answer should be leave Sabahans to Sabahans. Leave Sarawak to the Sarawakians. Uh, we can manage ourselves okay. based on the uh, rights provided in the Malaysia Agreement 1963. But AMNO has given AMNO Sabah uh, This is the problem. Uh, the uh, political parties from Malaya go in there and interfere <laughs> and create havoc and create disunity among the people. Okay. And I think, I think we have to what I call reset the okay. political thinking we must reset I think Sabahans and Sarawakian they can take care of themselves okay. can you imagine I said we are parochial definitely we are parochial because we are rich in resources okay. vibrant in economy as what Anwar was saying yes. but yet we have the highest poverty rate in Malaysia. I got you. The poorest state in Malaysia. Dato, I got you. That is a very sad state yes. of affairs. So I'm going to suggest for the organizer to have a specific topic on this. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for your views. But having said that, Dato, I was born in Perlis. Right? Don't have oil. My grandparents couldn't go to school because there's no school within walking distance. Even when my father was born, his white shoes were around his neck because there's no road. He has to walk through the mud of the paddy fields. And yet, the airport was taken away from Perlis and put in Kubang Pasu. The North-South Highway wasn't ending in Padang Besar. Legitimately, that should be the way for commerce. It was put because of political decisions. This is what we're talking and discussing today. These decisions are made by the people that we voted in as a political party block 
And yet, the five years when they are in the two honorable day one, what do they do, right? So, to conclude all that, and, and I love Sabah and Sarawak more than I love my state. During my days in Awani, there's this belt called Awani Sarawak, the only 15-minute national news channel dedicated only to Sarawak. But that is not enough. The political parties must do more. Whose job is it to explain about MA63, whether it's a federation like America or not? Does it mean that Sabah is a state, Sarawak is a state, or a special territory? All these are not explained. So how do we have a united Malaysia? So I look back at the three people. Please answer all these great questions for us. In summary, to close, Hayo, uh, organizer can uh, bola pun ada masa tambahan ma. Can I get five more minutes? Okay, I say baik dia bagi. So, no statement, only question. Agreed? Before I allow you guys to ask, do we agree? Can we have a baik ah? Unlike the political parties, one question, no statement, right? One question, one question, one question. Is so that one, two, three, four, five. Okay, please go ahead, decide first. Assalamualaikum. My name is Chetno. Uh, I'm going within the topic of are political parties essential in parliamentary yes, just us. democracy? Yep. Okay, yes. The problem here is when political parties and the elected uh, member of parliament go for the election campaign, they are manifesto. Manifesto meaning promises. Yep. Okay, so we, we identify that. Then after that, like what you have mentioned on stage, they have party hopping happily. Yeah. Now, my question is, there is a trust deficit here. Now, when you talk about trust deficit, you not only have to manage the citizen, the voters, you must also manage overseas. Foreign leaders, foreign diplomatic that deals with Malaysia. Okay. So, my question is, if this doesn't stop, when, if we do not tow the line, people will not come here to invest, people do not want to work with us. So, on a bigger macro level, this has to stop and yep. parliamentarians have to behave. Thank you. So, that's not a question, right? That's a statement. No, it is a question because you, 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 you're stopping me, so I can't, so I cut it short. So, what's the question? How do you want? So, my question is, how do you want to stop okay. this within an effective way in the meaning of parliamentary democracy at the same time, conducting yourself as a statesman. Thank you. For the whole party, right? Not for themselves. Yeah, for okay. the whole party, exactly. So you yes. have to represent your political leadership. Second. Hi, everybody. I'm, my name is Yasir Arafat from uh, Pertubuan, Sorabalia. Okay. Okay, uh, I have a two question, but I make it one for you guys. Okay, now we are talking about Undi 18, Undi 18. Yes. But eventually, the Otis which already gazetted, which they are not coming up for. But we are still focusing on Undi 18. What for? If the voters who already gazetted, mm. who already listed, they are not coming for. Okay. So in terms of that, the strategy of the party leaders who are here, they know better than me. So they need to think about it. And the second thing, we need to understand our Malaysia is a parliamentary democracy, which is... Okay. Uh, managed by YDPA. When the tita, bila di tita dikeluarkan kita harus terima. Kenapa parti politik di Malaysia susah sangat nak terima okay. berkaitan dengan perkara yang okay. diberikan Done. ataupun dititakan oleh yang, yes. yang dipertuan nanti. So first you're asking, you said you want to combine one but it's actually still two. One <laughs> is, why we focusing on Undi 18 when even the registered voters are not coming out to vote? Right? Okay. Second is, Agong has said, just follow. That's what you're saying. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next. Assalamualaikum, salam sejahtera and a very good afternoon. So, my name is Haziq. I am 18 years old and I am the president of the Penggerak Akak Umbi Selangor dan Kuala Lumpur. So, my, I have two questions to be brought here. I'm going to make it very brief and short but concise and precise. The first question is, is it very relevant to implement the Anti-Hopping Act 
and what are the consequences if it is implemented in our country here in Malaysia? Because uh, we want to avoid uh, leaders from political parties or even from the House of Representatives to hop from another party to another and betray the mandates from the people who voted them in. The second question is, is it relevant to implement the maximum age limit for the, for the parliament members to avoid absolute power and give chance to the rest who are very potential to lead the constituency especially and of okay. course the nation? Okay. Uh, I I'm very enthusiastic to hear your perspectives. Thank you very much. Okay. Next, please. Please don't touch the mic for SOP purposes. Just, just yeah, say it to it. We can hear. Jerit je. Ah. Hello, Michael. Yes, welcome, Salam. Represent Muda. Okay. Saya represent women in politics. You just tarik the 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 tiang. Jangan pegang the mic. Nanti SOP MOH marah kita semua. Sepuluh ribu tau seorang. Okay, I repeat ya. Yeah. My name is Farah. Uh, I'm from Muda. Uh, represent women in politics. Uh, this is my my friend. Muda also, have a question. Uh, so I'm Kavita. I am okay. a journalist by profession and I also am a representative for Muda. Okay. So my question is since you brought up women participation, so women participation in politics, and we both are very vocal about it. So my question is do you think uh, gender quota is democratic? Because when it comes to voting, gender is not an issue, but why is okay. it when it comes to women representation in politics, there is a quota system? And in the past government, they promised like 30%, but even that is not fulfilled. Okay. So what, why is there a margin? Because we fight for merit-based concept okay. over gender-based. So that's my question. All right. Thank you. So it shouldn't matter. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yes. uh, talking about 30% of women's I politics. Tolong tak jat jat tadi nanti dia tolong kan? SOP, SOP. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, talking about the 3% of women in politics, uh, I still didn't see any political party reach that quota and why? Yeah. Mm. That's the question. So you want it to be like Sweden where more than 50% are women. Okay, um, who wants to start first? They all point to you. So Because you are cynical. Cynical YB gets first. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm cynical, then Sharil can respond. Okay, go go. One sec, masa dah tak ada. Okay, go on. <laughs> okay, uh, how to prevent uh, party hopping? I think uh, these the voters must uh, teach the uh, uh, candidates a lesson. Make sure that none of those who hopped uh, this time around will win in any of the seats in the coming yes. election, number one. Uh, number two, the other parties must also have uh, the moral uh, strength to reject okay. uh, uh, any form of cooperation with the party hoppers. Because yes. I, 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 I put the responsibility, uh, Sharil, I know you say I'm being cynical, but actually it's uh, factual. Uh, if if uh, Mohyuddin and Azmin uh, had left Pakatan Harapan, but if AMNO passed uh, and the rest had respected the public's mandate, the people's mandate, then they wouldn't have formed a government with these people who hopped. And if uh, nobody is willing to cooperate with them in order to form a new government, then they would not have uh, hopped. But if you're willing to do it, then of course you allow for that. And uh, of course the last one is the anti-hopping law, which uh, was also a question, is it relevant? Uh, yes, it is very relevant, but what you do is that you allow them to have a, a, a re-election. So those who want to leave, they say because of the principles, they see that their party has, uh, uh, has uh, not has okay. diverted. Yeah. Uh, say for example, for the Amanah MPs, when we won in 2013, we won on a, a pass uh, ticket, uh, but when we left pass uh, in 2015 to form Amanah, uh, then uh, what should have happened is that we said, okay, now PAS is leaving Pakatan Rakyat, so we resign and we have uh, a, a new uh, by-election so that we can show uh, whether uh, the public in Shah Alam, in my case, uh, still support me uh, because I want to be with uh, Pakatan uh, Rakyat and Pakatan Harapan or whether they believe that I should still stay in PAS. So that would have, uh, that would have uh, been a deterrent for those okay. who... Uh, jump and do party hopping for their own personal uh, benefit. Uh, okay, the second question is, uh, what's the use of Undi uh, 18? Uh, 
uh, when registered uh, do not vote. Uh, the fact that registered do, do not uh, vote doesn't mean that the rights of, the, of those who are 18 and above uh, should be denied. We hope that the uh, younger generation are more uh, politically uh, savvy, politically conscious, and they realize that the government should be uh, elected by the people. So uh, maybe the older generation, uh, because of uh, various reasons, they do not uh, see the need because they say no matter what, Barisan will win. Yeah? So uh, that was the old uh, attitude. Lah. Okay, Agung said, uh, so just follow. Uh, we can't do that because ours is uh, a constitutional monarchy. And the reasons why uh, the Agung uh, declares uh, something, we, we have the right to uh, voice our opinion. It's still fundamentally a democracy. And we should all uh, accept that as a fact. Uh, and uh, there should not be any uh, hesitation on our part if uh, the... Uh, current executive uh, tries to exploit the COVID situation in order to declare an emergency, whereas there's nothing that's being implemented now that needs the emergency to be declared for it to be implemented. All the SOPs, all the uh, uh, MCOs and all that can and are being practiced even though there, there's no emergency. So we have to inform uh, the, the Agong and the Agong, uh, uh, I, I believe, uh, will... Uh, listen, and that's one of the reasons why he came out with the uh, statement that uh, there's nothing wrong for the uh, parliament to sit, uh, even though in an emergency. Uh, and he did uh, declare that uh, in the spirit of the constitution, he's not going to uh, uh, call for the parliamentary uh, sitting, okay. but unfortunately, he's the one who's trying to follow the spirit of the constitution, but the current government uh, doesn't follow the spirit of the constitution. Uh, okay, uh, is it relevant to MP men? Yes, I've answered that. Max age limit uh, for MPs, I think that's something which uh, the rakyat themselves will decide. If they feel that somebody who's 100 years old is still capable of leading and being their, their representative, then that's their right. Uh, if you uh, hold their age against them, uh, then they will lose the, the elections if uh, the voters feel otherwise. So that's, that's part and parcel of democracy. Uh, the question of gender quota, is it democratic, 30%? Uh, obviously, based on the uh, uh, proportion of uh, the female population in the country, it should be more. 30% is stated as a minimal, as a minimum uh, percentage, uh, which we strive for uh, because we want the women to be more uh, politically conscious, more politically involved. And we know that there are more women who are in the workplaces, who are more involved in uh, businesses, in the economy and all that. And the situation which, is, uh, which, which we are faced with uh, is obviously very different from what it was uh, 50 years ago or, or, uh, and so on and uh, so forth. So we want to encourage uh, female participation okay. and because of that, we set a, yeah. uh, a minimum uh, standard of the Wabi, percent. the first th yeah. lady's question. Overseas losing confidence is not just about us. So what do we do? Well, I think that was again uh, related to the uh, political uh, hopping again, yeah, party okay. hopping and all that. So I think uh, I've mentioned the various uh, okay. steps that needs to be taken, including uh, a legal approach, which is the... So that you will yes, remedy. You can. Okay. But okay. obviously, this is where I, I, what I'm saying is that individuals who are spoiling the image of the country should not be supported and should not be helped. And this is the spirit of democracy where if you've lost an election, stay as opposition. And I, I have to take my head off to a few UMNO members who said no. Yes, a few uh, UMNO leaders yeah, yeah. Who in the initial stages, okay. they said no. Uh, we lost the election, we'll wait for the uh, uh, general elections again. We're not going to be a uh, party to this uh, okay. uh, conspiracy and form a... So for you, uh, hold the parties accountable also? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Is my deal? No, thank you for the questions. I think the, 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 the very purpose of political party, all the exercises for me, at least in contact. Malaysia in the 1970s or at least late 60s, we are the same level with Taiwan. We are the same level with South Korea. We are the same level with Singapore, for that matter, after they left us. But where are we now? So I think all these exercises in the name of political party, of course, has to go towards that. If it reflects more uncertainty, instability, where it causes a serious economic repercussion, I think, I agree, we need a strong rule of law. And of course, even on that note, uh, what I'm doing now, we're engaging with the stakeholders. Uh, so far, we have engaged uh, three 
kinds of stakeholders. We invited from the corporate sectors, especially the directors of the government affairs, they came in parliament, and we engaged with the civil society, and also with academicians, and of course, uh, soon going to be among uh, politicians. But, frankly speaking, no, while we here can say, let's go for anti-hopping law, but if you consider the kind of arguments that uh, occur during the discussion, you'll be surprised. Because I come from Penang, I was in the committee uh, to set up, I was with the late Kapal Singh, we even uh, legislated the law. The law is there in Penang. But to be frank, it's still uh, not yet uh, to be seen uh, in effect. Why? Of course, the, the political will and so many other things. That's one. Number two, uh, I try not to answer all the questions specifically, but I try to put things together. For me, number one, why we are still talking about, let's say, quota, uh, whether gender, whatsoever, because democracy is not only about uh, majority is also about empowering the minority. Are all minority only about the male and female? To my surprise, when I have my disabled daughter, then I tell myself, look here, things are so inhumane. They are treated as afterthought. They are treated as a tokenism. So we never even think like what is good for the disabled must be good for the common people. But we always think what is good for common people, it must be good for the disabled. I don't think so. We only take them at the, at the, at the later stage. Only when, uh, when Kapal Singh cripples, uh, was given a physical challenge, then we realize our parliament not very humane after 60 tahun, tak manusiawi. And that applies to our idea of development. Okay, back to the very most fundamental question, which I always argue as the big elephant in the room, is parochialism. And James, Dato' James, thanks for the question. I, I, actually, I haven't completed my, my explanation just now. Pericalism, I argue, is more dangerous than racism, not because of Sabah Sarawak, no. Because the, 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 the main political challenges for me today is not very much freedom of speech, not very much freedom of association, but planning law, urban, uh, urban planning, because that way it starts the main problem. For example, I'm in Balik Pulau, I will always consider countryside. Those in Georgetown, it's always urban. That way things started. The quality education only in urban. The less quality education, maybe not in the countryside. And then, what will happen to me? Where the, the scheme of the law doesn't distinguish between urban and rural. The tax that is imposed to me are the same. So for me, that's why in other countries like Peru, Hernando de Soto said, property right is the way to go to eradicate poverty because you have to dismantle the landlord and tenant problem whatsoever. So for me in Malaysia, we have to really go to the crux of the problem. What is the real problem between Sabah and Sarawak and Malaysia? I agree with you. At least we have agreement to start with. Uh, Perjanjian Malaysia, kan? But for me, if the thinking there is still parochial, and the, 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 we cannot break the, 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 the dichotomy between rural and urban, for example, oh, Semenanjung is more important than Sabah Sarawak, then we are wrong. For me, I agree with you, we can't tolerate the day that we have a rich state like Sabah, but yet, orang miskin ramai, kan? So for me, nowadays, we are ready to, to put our head, we can't afford to have a very imbalance. That's why I say the, the, the main, the big elephant in the room is uh, our idea of development has to be humane, has to be no, uh, has to be no parochial. Okay, last point. What is all about? How, how to create more more, more motion? We need an effective state. Effective state reflect capacity of delivery system. Uh, delivery system will reflect how effective, how good is your public goods. Public goods can be health, can be property rights, can be whatsoever. Secondly, yes, someone argue when Yang Diputok Agong say we have to follow. In a country where it subscribes to the rule of law, any institution cannot be above the law. And here I think we have a very uh, respected Yang Diputok Agong who show by example, he, he not just simply, okay, Kamarul, come here, I appoint you as a Prime Minister. No. He understands the provision of the constitution. He invites everyone to come to the uh, palace and express your confidence or your support through that prime Of course, now it demands creativity. If you study the law, since Stephen Kaloninkan case, until today, we have so many examples. Stephen Kaloninkan case, the law says the confidence must be in the hall. Suddenly, it moved to Perak. The confidence actually in the hall of the palace. And now recently, it goes for another level. And sadly to say, what happened recently is the first uh, experience. The rest are at state level. At the federal level, that was the first time. So for me to argue that Stephen Kalonikan case is the, locus, uh, the, the classic, locus classicus uh, to follow, not necessarily so. 
in order to take the Sarawak, not necessarily so. If you ask me, there are so many abuse. How come statutory declaration is supposed to be meant for something else? Was used for, for, for something else and it was abuse. So for me, the rule of law needs to be strengthened. So whether we are doing a good job, I have to say, to certain years, we are the most respected Commonwealth country with certain standard of rule of law. Most of our judges, I still remember, uh, I can mention name, if of course not many people mention about this guy. I know Dr. Uh, Ma, I, I know him, he was a very uh, dedicated practitioner. Now, where are he? He's not in the public research company, he's the Suhakam. Give a big hand lah. <laughs> this is not a very commercial job. And I know judges, Tansi said Osman Ali Alatas, who involved in the Sepa Kalunigan case. Where was he? The day he retired, the only position that he took was a specific foundation. Not some other commercial uh, organization which may encroach his, 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 his uh, commercial uh, interest. So last point, I have, I have, I have to say, uh, is it, are we, conc we are concluding? Huh? concluding. Okay. That actually now, this for the first time, our country since uh, 1957 was uh, forced to think bigger, more creatively, how actually now to respond to our brothers and sisters in Sabah, Sarawak, because all this while, things are not so responsive. So now, I think now they are so responsive, and I think it's good for the country. So it, it really forced us, especially young generation, to think what is good for Malaysia from place sampai Sabah, Sarawak. Okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, I realize that uh, we are pressed for time. So I'll just go uh, very quickly to some of the questions. I think uh, the question about voter turnout and why we even talk about Undi 18, I am in this case in agreement with Wabi Khalid, just because people don't show up to vote doesn't mean that you, they shouldn't be given the right to choose to not show up to vote. <laughs> right? So it's, it's, uh, the, the, the arguments don't, one doesn't follow the other. Uh, so this is one of the, but Frustratingly, this is one of the arguments that are often uh, seen by people who don't support Undi 18. The kematangan tak ada, yang ada pun tak keluar Undi. That's not the point. That's really not the point. Um, uh, so I'll juga uh, yang di Pertuan Agong. Um, this is a, yang di Pertuan Agong is a constitutional monarch. It's not an absolute monarch, right? So the rest of the how you read that from, I think uh, uh, read from that. I think Wabi Khalid had already uh, mentioned uh, Hazik says, is it relevant to have anti-hopping law? Other people have uh, indicated the same kind of questions. My answer is yes, as I said in my introductory remarks. The mechanics of it, I think, is too technical to speak here, but uh, recall elections is an option. What are the terms under which the recall elections can be made? Cannot be so free and easy, lah. otherwise, yang menang pun, kalau menang tipis, people just call him recall balik, kan? so cannot juga. So that, that, that's a mechanical or, or more you know, uh, technical question, but it doesn't run away from the fact that I think we absolutely need uh, to disincentivize hopping, especially the kind that we have seen now. Max age limit, I also have in this round, banyak setuju pula dengan uh, di Parlimen Syak Alam, uh, where I don't think lah you should do, you should block just because of, you know, nanti ageism pula. Eh? So, um, as he says, if people hold it against that person because of his age, then it should be born in the votes that he or she doesn't get. Um, Muda representatives uh, mention whether gender quota is relevant. Uh, yes, I do believe it is relevant um, because as YB Yusmadi says, is often quotas become a question when we feel that uh, the minority uh, isn't uh, represented in a particular uh, you know, line up. Uh, minority isn't always nominal or quantitative minority, but that's a whole different other philosophical discussion. But in this case, because uh, for whatever reason, for you know, structural, traditional reasons, women are not represented enough in politics as they are not in other areas of life, then the question of quota becomes relevant. Um, doesn't mean it should be there forever, uh, just as the question of certain Malay quotas shouldn't be there forever, uh, but it is something definitely legitimate to be considered and is in no way saying that m women who get to a certain place because of quotas uh, are less uh, meritorious in their position. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's my answer to that question. In general, just yeah. in conclusion, a quick yes. conclusion, I feel that uh, the spirit of this uh, forum is really in the end about integrity 
it's really about how we move our politics towards more policy-based discussions. And if we can get to those two places, then I think we're in a better spot. Thank you. Ms. Modi, one thing you take away from here. Just one last point. One, one last. Uh, I think it's about time for us to, 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 to think about political ethics. But for me, it may sound a bit oxymoron. Political ethics. But I think what I mean is that there must be some form of ethical way in politics. At least when I was in uh, India, uh, the Election Commission, together with International Development Agency, International Ideas, they brought all uh, political parties from South Asia to think about the influence of money in political uh, they call it, uh, representation. That had to, uh, to start from political party, political will, and I have to congratulate them. Before we started, we thought how to get a political party from Pakistan up to Maldives to agree on political party, whereby the issue of black money is so rampant in India. But of course, to your surprise, the first party who agree is Communist Party. The party that they say, I have to go back and check, of course, the established party. The question you can answer. So now, for me, when I say about political ethics, is it something new? No. It is a form of governance that we have to think. Because if law per se, I see the limit of law. I'm a lawyer. I'm a believer in the rule of law. But when it comes into democracy, politics, as Datuk Sri Anwar said, it has to be the habits of the heart. It has to be the democratic culture. It cannot be just another legalistic black letters mundane because it's about creating a community. And I think all this exercise, it has to be about a nation building, not another black, black, uh, uh, legalistic black letters uh, exercises. That's all. Sometimes when you Madi gave his point, I, I, I have to see whether he's the lawyer speaking or the politician speaking, but he combines those two very well. Why we can it? Last one point only. Just uh, the main point, I think uh, I agree with uh, Sharil and also uh, Yusmadi. Uh, the direction that we have to go is uh, politics, which is more principled. And, and this we hope lah, we will be able to uh, uh, develop within the next uh, few years. Uh, issues of uh, race and uh, religion uh, should never be politicized. And uh, what we should all uh, look for are the kind of uh, universal values that will ensure uh, better administration and good governance for Thank you. Please give a big hand to all my three panelists. I purposely influenced the organizer to sit beside Wabi Khalid because I know if anything comes that resembles close to Dewan Rakyat kind of bickering will come from here first. But thank you so much for making my job not that tough. Wabi Ismadi, always a pleasure. The legal and political mind I speak. And I put Wabi Sharil furthest from me because if you go to his social media handle, one of it is not, he's a daddy, but he doesn't want to have a daddy bot. So I'm trying to emulate him. So I sit a bit further. But what the takeaways for me from this discussion is, at the end of the day, the answer is yes, they are relevant. However, who puts the fear of God onto the political parties and their leaders? Because if they control so much, they are so essential in the democracy, in between the ballot boxes, how do we ensure that every single Malaysian are well represented and justly? So the reform of institution, I disagree with Mabi Yusmadi on one point today. I don't think that freedom of speech is secondary because the day you start saying that that is negotiable is the day that you will find me as a politician. Because if I can't beat them, I have to beat them at their own game. Because I believe, with the media speaking, we know the poverty in Sabah and Sarawak. Kampung Munggu Jabang pointed to the top of the tree and said, Saya mau itu hijau. And I thought, why would this Iban grandmother matriarch want pass in Lubo Antu? He, she wanted Petronas Dagangan. She wanted a petrol station. At the same time in Kuching, Yang Ahmad Berhormat Ketua Menteri was talking about how under mining ordinance 56 and 58 of Sarawak, Petronas shouldn't be taking anything out of Sarawak. So I'm caught in the two worlds, but that's what media can do. That's what this course can do. Thank you so much for making this course still living and breathing in Malaysia. And I would like to thank ISI Please give a big round of applause because democracy is still being discussed in Malaysia. Thank you. Goodbye.
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes our first session for today. It was an interesting topic. It was a very heated topic. And also on a personal note, uh, Mr. Kamarul, thank you very much for bringing up Borneo into the play. As a Sabahan myself, I'm very, very glad to see uh, at least Sabah topics being brought up more in this kind of forums. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to, I'd like to invite Mr. Chia to actually come up and give the, our token of appreciation to our panelists and also our moderator for participating for our event today. Please.